here with Kevin Easterly today, and we got introduced a few weeks ago by a mutual friend and realized we had a lot in common. We're franchisees of the same brand, actually in the same state. We both live out of state, and he's um, big time into real estate. And I thought, man, I need, I need to know this guy. He's got a great Facebook group. And um, we got introduced, had a phone call, and, uh, and here we are. And one of the things that I wanted to get into with Kevin today is the art of the turnaround, going in and finding opportunities within franchises and seeing uh, the opportunity of an underperforming location and going in, turning it around, and then whatever happens next, keep it cash flow it or sell it and, and pull some cash out of it, whatever it is. But Kevin's doing that today with um, in, in different states. And so we will get into that. But Kevin, um, love to... Uh, um, dive into your origin story like how did you even get started in franchising um yeah it's a great question thanks for having me on here this is awesome yeah. i love the podcast and uh, i'm super pumped to be on it so awesome um so i was doing the apartment investing buying little fourplexes with my money and i was running a, a wedding video business and i had a friend a long time friend i hadn't seen in years and i went and sat down with them and he's like hey I got this opportunity. It's a Club Pilates franchise. And I'm going, man, I don't know anything about Pilates and I don't know anything about franchises. <laughs> um, and I just had sold some property, so I had some cash. And he's like, you know, told me about buying three and that's the way to go instead of just buying one. So I'm like, yeah, give me three. I'm like, I'll figure <laughs> it out. So that's literally how it started. He had owned, he had owned, I'd had seen his success with two massage envies. And so uh, throughout, you know, the last 10 years, so I was like, man, next time this guy's doing a franchise, I want to hop on it. As all your friends, I'm sure, you know, they see, <laughs> they see how they are and then they start saying, oh, how do I get in that? It's so true. I got started a very similar way. I sold some, I jumped into a real estate deal, um, luckily sold it and bought my first one. And I realized at the time, like, you know, I jumped into it without doing nearly the kind of due diligence that I do today when I look at stuff. But it was the best thing that I did. And I see so many people miss out because they want to have 100% of the information before they actually make a decision. So um, sometimes going to the gut is the way to go. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was before Exponential bought them out too. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, man, this lady owns them. I'm like, sure. And it took a while. I mean, if you don't do the research like I did and I guess like you did the first time, um, it just costs you more money because you got to learn all the – you got to learn along the way. So it, that one costed me money, um, you know, more, more than if I just did one today and did all the research and knew what I was doing. Um, yeah, my biggest once, thing was marketing. Because once you know what, what it looks like on the inside, you know what to look for. You know what a great brand that's, that is ready for prime time looks like and, and that what they have in place and what they don't. And if they don't have the things in place and you have that skill set, then it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, location. I mean, there's so many things, man, that if I could go back, I would do different. Like location, I got, I'm in the back of, my first one's in the back of a shopping center in the corner because I got a great deal. I was like, oh, this is awesome. It's all about the deal. It's not then, about the deal. No. It, a lot, especially retail fitness. It's not about the deal. It's about the location. And I've struggled with the same thing. I'm like, oh, I could go over here and it's a great deal. No, you pay more and, and it's worth it. Not always yeah. is, the, is that the case, but yeah, more sure. times than not and what you and I are doing, 100%. So you have three Club Pilates in Correct. Denver and you live in San Diego? Correct. Yep. And so, like you said, you bought this before Anthony Geisler and Exponential Fitness bought it. And he was on an earlier episode of the Franchise Story podcast. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great one. And, and Anthony is just a, a genius when it comes to this boutique fitness and franchising. Um, so, so when he came on board, like big difference between pre exponential fitness or someone with a lot of franchising experience and post how, what was that like? Uh, before, um, uh, exponential came on. Yeah. Yeah. So we had no, we had no support, you know, in corporate, there was two ladies working in the corporate and they basically just gave you the studio and they said, go for it buy whatever you want, equipment you want, buy, do whatever, you know, taking us, they take a tiny percentage, they don't know anything about it. So we just literally winged it, right? So I hired a Pilates instructor and just had no back, uh, had no support, right? Had now knowing what I know now with them, I, I mean, it was no, nothing. <laughs> um, 
yeah, man. And then they came in and bought in and I was like, man, who are these guys? Oh, the whole brand's going to go to the, go to the toilet. And then we started seeing them make these turns and I was like, holy cow, this is insane. They'd call me on my P and L's and be like, what are you even doing? Just hanging <laughs> out over there. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so yeah, man, it was a, it was a blessing at the end. Right now it was a blessing. And you're getting ready to head out there, right? You're, I'm flying to California today. You're flying to Denver. And, yeah. um, and where are your locations in Denver? Like where My about? locations are in uh, Lakewood, Colorado, Ken Carl, Colorado, and Greenwood Village, Colorado. Great. We're looking at a location for another concept uh, near your Ken Carl place. Um, yeah, so uh, fast forward, are you buying any more clubs? Where are you with them? Are you kind of done? Club Pilates? Club Pilates. Um, right now, well, as you know, then I got approached with, because I'm a successful operator now, not, not before exponential, um, they approached me and to, to purchase the, um, underperforming studios at a discount, right? When they take over a brand, as you know, um, there's all these owners that don't know what they're doing. They have zero faith. They want out, they got sold a whole different ball game. They just want out of there. So that's, we walk in, you know, it could be partner uh, partner issues. It could be financial issues. Some of these guys were told, turn the key, walk away, and you're going to make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. Turn the key, they spent a bunch of money and they made no money. And then when they start to contract, as you know, they cut the marketing and then no more people are less customers start coming in. And then <clears throat> they cut the staff because they don't have money to pay them. And now the customers aren't happy. So they leave and it's just a downward spiral. It's a snowball effect, right? I mean, and I see people start to make bad decision after bad decision. Once they walk away, they probably have a, the, an employee that shouldn't be in there running the thing. And so they probably trusted the wrong employee, didn't make the right hire, didn't fire him quick enough. And then things, like you said, to start to spiral out of control. And it's, I, what I've seen is one bad decision after another. When, and then they get to the point where they're just ready to, uh, to give up. And then someone like you comes in, like, what's your mindset looking at an opportunity like that? So, yeah, first things first is I give the owner a call, have a chat with them, see what's going on, right? Um, if the owner says, yeah, I do all this marketing, you know, we doing, we're doing everything that I'm going to come in there and do. I mean, that's a dead turn away that maybe it's a bad location. Maybe there's something else going on. So those ones our team won't mess with. But you have a conversation with them and family member got sick or a partner issue um, or they ran out of money and then you start talking about location and what they're doing. I mean, by the 15th time you talk to these people, you can kind of figure out exactly what's going on on a one hour phone call. So these aren't club plot is that you're buying. This is a different brand, right? Correct. This is cycle bar. So exponential approached me and said, you know, you're a successful owner. Would you like to buy this one cycle bar? And so my buddy had simultaneously called me that week and said, Hey, I want to get into franchising. And I was like, you know, I got three, I got the apartments going, so I don't really have time to do it. But if you want to jump in one, awesome. He said, he's like, okay. So we hopped in one cycle bar and that was Henderson, Nevada. Um, that was June of last year. And so then let's back up. you right, had, so you got approached to, uh, because you were successful with club Pilates you got approached to help um, buy out an existing underperforming cycle bar. You had a buddy that wanted to get into franchising and then you ended up partnering together to buy this one club uh, cycle bar in Henderson. Yes, correct. And there was actually, yeah, two of us, but yeah. Two, so there's there, how many partners in total is there? So there's three partners in this a so three partners is one of them like the kind of the point person on the ground. So even on the ground, but just the, the one that's responsible. Um, well, yeah, that's myself. So I'm kind of running, you know, see, acting as CEO right now. Um, so I run the operations day to day. Uh, one of them is a franchise owner, a boat franchise owner, freedom boat club here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So he gets the membership and free and, um, franchise model. So mm -hmm. he wanted to get in. So I brought him in and the third guy is just a sales corporate guy. And, um, I figured, you know, I think this is a, I like this because I'm like, he doesn't know anything about the franchise industry, but he knows a lot about the corporate. He can set up my sales teams and he can make them sell that nobody else is doing because this guy's a different breed. Right. So I brought him in because I wanted to switch it up and try to be better than everybody. 
why not just do it yourself? That's what I, I hear people say, well, I want all of the money to myself. I want to do it all myself. Like, what was it yeah. you that wanted to bring in other people? Because do you own Club Pilates yourself? I do. So uh, now your second one, you brought in two other people. Like, what's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, I mean, at that point, I was kind of trying to retire. <laughs> and I'm like, man, all I want to do is golf every day. And I'm like, I don't want to work a lot. I don't want to work hard. And I want to, I want to bring my friends up. Right. So now mm -hmm. I want to help my buddies out. So I gave the 50% of the whole um, S Corp away to those three. And then I went and uh, called one person to work for me for Club Pilates. I gave her 5% plus a salary, brought her over. And I, I brought a director of operations, gave him 5% of the company plus a salary, sold him the dream or told him the dream. And I mean, they want to jump in. And so that's, yeah, that was my thing is I want to help my friends out and I want to see them be successful. And so I gave away half it to all of them. What have you seen from giving away 5% uh, equity to somebody like what, what does that, has that done in their output of production for the, for oh, the company? It's, it, it's insane, you know? So the, this director of operations is probably getting paid, I don't know, 85 to 95 a year. And I purposely said, you know, I'll give you 60 plus bonuses just to cut them down and have them come in there and work hard. And I'll say, I'll give you 5%. I gave him the 10 year or seven year roadmap. And he was like, all right, I'll take a shot. I've known the guy for 10 years. And I'm like, I want to help this guy out. So it's been really cool, man. He works hard. He works harder. He says to me, he goes, I'll be there anytime you need me and I'll leave whenever you want. He goes, I've never worked this hard in my whole life. So there you go. He's making less, working harder than he ever has, but but he has a roadmap of of where he'll be in in yep. three, five, and ten years. And so, I uh, I read a book about sorry I read a book about that too about hiring high level people when you don't have the money to do it, and that's a great way to do it and give away piece of your equity. What's that book? Do you remember? Um. Yes, it's called Make uh, Big Make Big Happen by Mark Moses. You're, you're reading that right now. I saw on social media. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah just like, yeah. Riding a bike, reading the book. Okay. <laughs> so I actually saw him at an EO, uh, entrepreneur organization. You ever you, been to one of those in I, EO? I haven't. I have a lot of friends that are involved with that. Are you part of EO? Or did I you not, but the, I, like meet and greet things? I went to the meet and greet, but I'm going to join in uh, January. That's one thing we're going to do. But he yeah. actually spoke there. Oh, that, they have great speakers. I'm part of another mastermind. That's where we have our mutual friend. And I've heard just incredible things about, you know, my podcast partner in um, Franchise Story. He's in the uh, chapter in Sacramento and I have friends in the, oh, cool. yeah, friends in the San Diego chapter as well. So, yeah. Yeah, that's where they met you. Yep. So, um, so here you are, you've got a team. How many, so you, you had one or two cycle bars that you took over. Like what did, what, like day number one it was probably losing money <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. underperforming stores are not like making a bunch of money and it was probably losing money. You're walking into a situation where the franchisee is probably disappointed because they weren't able to do what they had wanted to do. And they probably came to the realization at some point, like they are the X factor. There's probably other things that happen, but they are not the ones to take this thing to where it's going to go. And you come in and you're like, I have a successful pass. I've got the team put together. What do you do uh, day number one? So day number one, you go in there and hopefully you've had con contact with the manager prior to this. But if you have not, then you go in there and you talk to the manager. Um, I hired two regional managers, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. So I go in there with my regional manager and the other owners, have a conversation with the staff. That's the first thing ask them what's going on. And you usually get the, uh, the real story when you talk to the staff about the owner, you know, it's, he cut off all the money. He wouldn't let us do anything. He wouldn't let us buy any retail. He was a prick. Nobody liked that or whatever, you know, you start getting, so that's the first step. And then, so like, so, and then how do you kind of judge whether this employee is actually, you know, legit or if they're just frustrated and they're, they're about ready to leave? Um, well, you can just talk to them, right? Same conversation you have with the owner. It's just, what do you guys, what have you been doing? Right. What's your day look like? And a lot of times to be honest with you, the fish rots from the head down and, mm -hmm. and that's the head of the fish. 
And so 99% of the time it doesn't work out. Right. So we with already that, have an add up prior with the with manager that initial with that manager. Right. That Correct. doesn't work yeah. out. Yep. Yep. I've seen that as well. You want it to, you hope it will, but like most of the time it doesn't. So you're going into these uh, turnaround situations, knowing that you're probably going to have to restaff this thing at some level, like you said, fish rots from the head down. So you're going in there, having that conversation with the manager, realizing some of the things that are broken and um, what they're telling you, but you're also realizing some of the stems from the manager themselves in, in many cases. And so are you looking for that key employee that's the rock that can hold things together or are you uh, just like completely rehiring? Yeah, I mean, you look for, so we usually put a GM ad up on Indeed or something, you know, before we go, uh, we go to what the studio. Like? To, Tell me what that looks like. The GM ad? Mm-hmm. Uh, we want them to be a team leader. We want them to, um, that's a big part, right? Um, be able to be part of a team. And um, we talk about what else is to have in there. Because um, what I've seen a lot is people, um, especially if they come from corporate America, their first hire is, is, is not always the, the greatest hire. Someone that looks really good on a resume and they, they put all the, the, the job duties that need to happen and things like that. But, you know, you're looking for someone specific that can lead that organization. You know, some franchises, you want someone that is really good at sales. Somebody, you know, in that GM role that has that sales mentality, knowing when customers come in, they need to understand like they are selling something. Others, yeah. you know, you just really want them to um, be really good with people. So like, or, and, or be able to lead that team. And I don't, I found it's hard to find that one GM that can do all of it, but you need to find one that has some of those major attributes of, of success. So I yeah. interrupted you. Go ahead. Keep going. Like, what no, no worries. Um, yeah. So sales, man, is a big, I know everybody, you know, we talk to corporate all the time, you know, they say higher sales hire a salesperson. We've done that. Um, and we've tried to grind our people really hard because our, my partner's a hardcore sales guy. So he tries to give them a full sales pitch and you know, it works to a certain extent, but we're finding more, you got to be with the culture. You got to love the brand. And that is so much more successful than the hardcore sales guy, right? They're going to start using their tactics. And I mean, I don't know, that's just in our experience. I haven't found a really good one. It's to me more about, I can teach her some, a lot of skills, but she's just got to have the personality to be there and the members want to be there, want want to want to be in there with them because in you in cycle bar and the same with a lot of these boutique fitness brands it's the customer experience and so 100%. the customer experience is is the selling it's not you using some type of tactic to get them you know fear yeah. of missing out or some, you know, some car, a hardcore sales process it is it's creating that customer experience that that's the sale. That's what they want, right? I mean, when they, when they go yeah. in, they need to have an amazing experience. So what, what is the customer, what do they experience when they go into a cycle bar? Yeah, I mean, when they go into the cycle bar, you get meet, it, you get meet and greet, right? They, you get your shoes picked out for you. They hand you your shoes. So all you have to do is walk in. You don't need anything, right? You don't even need a towel. We have your towels for you on the bike. They get eucalyptus, you know, they go in, do the ride. It's like, like a, what do they call it? Um, a uh, bike ride in a club or a spin class in a club is what he calls it. Um, so yeah. And then you have this great experience, right? Your instructors talking to you. We have a community room so you can hang out, meet other people or talk to your friends. We have lockers that we provide to you. We have showers that we provide to you. Eucalyptus oil towers, bananas. I mean, everything you come in and it's a full experience. It really is a full experience. So as you, um, so now you're going in and you've uh, probably you've had that GM, you've, inter what do you do for interviewing? Like how, what, what kind of process do you go through? I know we're getting into the weeds, but a lot of people um, I've seen, they just, they, we need to get in the weeds with some people because it's, this is, we talk big picture too many times and they miss some of the, the little things that they should be doing. So the ad goes up. Do you, do you yeah. use in LinkedIn? You use in, what are you using? Uh, we use indeed mostly or hierology kind of like sprays them out to different people. Um, you know, they're French. I think they're with the corporate franchise. So that's why we use them. Um, and then, yeah, it, you know, I talk to the owner and they'll say, the manager sucks, right? Or they'll say it doesn't even have a manager. It's just running on an assistant guy, right? <laughs> so 
whatever the case is, you know, maybe we'll, we'll probably interview if we need one, we'll interview five or six and try to have one lined up by the time we, we take over and meet that new manager in the studio the day one, right? If you have a manager, you go in there, you interview them, you have a couple, or I'm sorry, you got Indeed prior, maybe like interview, I mean, as many as you can look good, right? If they have health club experience, that's really good. If they have, uh, you know, cultural experience, that's kind of what I'm looking for. I mean, if they have some sales experience, that's great, but they don't have to be a sales hardcore person. Um, then it's all about the personality from there. You talk to them, have a conversation of what they've done, where they're going, what do they want to do? Do you do uh, interviews over like Zoom or Skype Zoom. or something? Zoom. Zoom, just like this, yep. Mm -hmm. Why do you do it do over one Zoom? One phone. Like one phone and then a Zoom call. So you want to talk to the people and see how they act when you talk to them. So you'll hire over over Zoom? Um, no, we used to bring them in for the final interview. Unless at the GM needs one, we'll hire over Zoom, yeah. Yeah. If we're out so, of state. So now um, you're coming in and what do you, what, what's the experience like for the members? Like all of a sudden there's a new owner there. Do they know or is it, does it, do they know by the experience changing or like, walk us through like what a member would would experience once you know kevin takes over yeah they they love it i mean every single time they're like you know by that time by the time you're taking over it's for a reason right mm -hmm. it's kind of like a value add apartment building for me it's like you go in there and the place is kind of run down so you go in there and make the changes pump some money into it start marketing get a new crew um i mean people are just ecstatic everything you do is just amazing so you haven't done just one of these. So you started out with one when they came to you. So give us kind of the, the, the history from your first one to where you are today and where you want to go. Yeah. Um, so we did one in June and then they called us up and said, Hey, we have two more. We go, yeah, sure. Let's take them on. So we took two more in July and then one in August, September, October, November, December. We have eight now. Eight. How many different states? one two three four states and when is it is it like oh, is it overwhelming for you or is it because you have the team in place it's not that overwhelming to have you know like you know 10 locations in you know four different states uh you know yeah i mean it always boils you know problem boils straight to me most of the time and you know when you're in, you're putting yourself you're buying eight failing businesses yeah it gets very stressful i mean it's the most stress i probably put myself through in my life but I could already see the end is in like three months um, or the, the light in the end of the tunnel is in like three months. And when you, when you build a team, it's just so much easier mm -hmm. to do everything. I mean, my regionals, one's in Connecticut, the other one's in uh, uh, NorCal. And so, I mean, they're up there with the clubs and they have their own clubs and it works out great. He's on the East Coast, he's on the West Coast. Have in place. Four different states. You've got an East Coast and a West Coast kind of DM. What give give some uh, color on what that infrastructure looks like? So you're yeah. So uh, report to okay, it's me and then my two partners are kind of part time in it, right? So it's basically me. Um, I have one of the partners sales or trains my man uh, my regionals, um, and then I have two regionals below us, right? So me and my partner basically, and then I have mm -hmm. two regionals below us, one on the east coast, one on the west coast, and then I have um. Below them, I have a director of operations that sits next to me in the office. One director or two directors? One. Okay. So he is the liaison to the, to the regionals most of the time, right? The regionals are liaison to the GM or whatever the GMs need for payroll or something, they'll go to him. So he's been a really great addition. Um, and then, yeah, and then below that is the GMs and below that's the staff. I think we have about 150 members are employees right now that's a lot yeah that's why so, you probably said you're stressed yeah and these, <laughs> and these hr people come to us and they're like well your hr gets treated like a walmart because you have a, over 100 employees i'm like great awesome <laughs> so yeah well, that kind of well you probably wouldn't be that stressed if you didn't have other things going on as well i mean sure. you I mean, give us some you know uh in, insight into your life. I mean, you're, you say, you have this awesome Facebook group, this mastermind in, in, in Aruba that yeah. I'm jealous. And I think I might want to like move things around so I can go. Yeah, man, it's going to be a good time. Uh, yeah. So I have apartments. I 
we have 105 apartments in Nevada and Arizona. Um, and then we have a Facebook group that's really active that's apartment investors, um, uh, syndicators, and franchise people in there. There's actually our franchise people are building up who started it doing apartments and then I wanted to bring more franchises in. Um, so explain why you did that. Like why apartments, real estate, and franchising? And like, you know, how does that relate to like your growth? So yeah, apartments, I always wanted to do apartments, right? I knew it's the end game. I know it's long-term equity. So I got into that and then I started listening to Grant Cardone and he basically tells you how to take it to the moon, right? And no I'm like, oh man, I'm like, you can go get a hundred units. No problem. He's showing you how to do it right here. So then my buddy came along with me with franchises. And I honestly, to be quite honest with you in the beginning, I was like, why the hell am I doing both of these? It's a waste of my time. And I'm splitting in two 180 degree. Nobody that I do French or multifamily with knows what the hell anything to do with franchises and then vice versa. And so I'm like, man, I'm just wasting my time. I'm spinning my wheels. And then I started seeing the cash flow of the Pilates. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, one of these studios cash flow is like a hundred units in apartments. So I'm like, I could start making this money. And then I went and did my taxes and the tax guy's like, and I didn't even, I didn't do this because of this. I went to a tax guy the first year in 2016 and he goes, you don't have to pay any taxes. I go, why is that? Because <laughs> you, you have a depreciation over here that you can depreciate all your income you're making over here. I was like, no way. So I didn't believe him. I was like, this got to be this too good to be true. So then I'm like, this is a great model. I'm like, I can make insane cash flow and then I can put it in equity as I go and then just have this fortress and then sail off the sunset if you want, right? So three, four years later, I'm still, yeah, it's still a great model. <laughs> so like what happens there is, you know, you're saving on taxes and really deferring on taxes and there's some savings, but let's just say it's a hundred percent deferral. Um, you are able to take that money and invest it into more apartments, more franchises and, and grow faster because of that. And eventually, you know, you, you'll have to pay at some point and there's strategies along the way on, on how to keep deferring or mitigating your taxes. But I mean, I've done the same thing when I was in the salon business, we had massive depreciation and accelerated depreciation. And I was able to grow other areas of my business because I wasn't paying the government as much. And I mean, I could defer it legally, defer it legally, not have to pay it where so many of my friends that weren't, that didn't have a strategy like that. They were like paying the government, like, half of every dollar that they made. I'm like, you guys are crazy. Insane, man. It's insane. I People got a bunch of get it. workers. Yeah. Man. But yeah, that's definitely, <sighs> that's why, and there's even more stuff out there with real estate these days um, that, that, are, that are just amazing for, for tax purposes. I'm sure you are very up to speed uh, more than you used to be five years ago on, on yeah. things like that. So now you have your, oh, you're living stuff, in these two yeah. worlds, the franchise world that doesn't know the apartment world, the apartment world that doesn't know the franchise world. You married everybody together in your Facebook group. And, and then you have put together this team to get a bunch of cycle bars. So you have 10 right now or almost 10? Yeah, uh, eight and I'll have 10 in July. Correct. Eight and 10 in July. Like, where are you going from here? You have a, over a hundred employees. Like what's the next number of years look like? Um, we're going to buy, so we did it. Our average is about one a month that we're, we're acquiring them by right now. So our goal is to get a hundred studios and along the way, those hundred studios with the cash flow, be buying apartments as we go and put, putting the cash flow in the apartments and then in seven or 10 years, you know, figure it out from there. So you and I were just talking about something before we hit the record button and that is like raising capital. Um, let's just talk about that right now, because it's something yeah. that, that I've talked to a number of my friends about. I've thought about doing myself. Um, and I, I'm an angel investor in different, in different things and a small angel investor. Um, but a lot of people out there don't have the money or don't have the time to, uh, they have a super high paying job. They want to get into franchising. They want to invest into it. I don't know anything out there that exists like a fund to for people to put in money so they can invest in 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 franchisees that's it capital um is out there for franchisors but not necessarily for franchisees for equity and things like that and so like what would be ideal for you like what if, if you could 
have some type of fund to help you grow that? Like, what would that look like? Yeah. So for myself or for the investors or everybody. Both. Both. So yeah, I mean, the way we would, the way we're talking about structuring a fund is doing it so they, the investors get a flat percentage from day one on their money. And then when we exit our deal, then they'll get a kicker on the back. They'll get their money back plus a kicker. So they're kind of like a preferred investor, right? So they're, so right. they're guaranteed X amount. And then depending on performance and whatnot on the back end, there's some, you know, on the, on the sale, then they can participate in the, in the upside on that to an extent. Correct. Yeah. And it's going to be exactly like an apartment deal. It's going to be a pref, you know, up front, And then you'll get after we pay our money, their money back, then maybe a waterfall down. So they'll get a smaller percentage after that, but they'll still be an equity partner in the deal. How, you know, so w looking back, you know, you're what about a year into it, 10, 10 locations, what would you have done differently in structuring your, your management and any lessons that you've learned along the way at the store level of that you would have done differently? Uh, structure the, well, yeah, that's a great question. Cause we just added a marketing manager, um, our marketing person, cause we have three next to each other. So a marketing person helps really, you know, out to outsource and get in the, get out in the field. So that's a huge addition that I would add every studio moving forward. What does that person do? Uh, they go to events, schedule all the events, schedule in-house events, bring in, bring in vendors, bring in sponsors, try to get us around town. It's probably one of those things like a, an owner that is losing money. That's probably the, the last thing that they would do yeah. as well. Isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They're not going to do that. No. They're already done spending money. Or you see the guys that are really rich that just have like a, a huge salary employee for manager and they have zero commission structures. So they have no motivation. They just sit around. So, yeah, I've seen that as well. I mean, it, so when people think about franchises that have failed or that are um, underperforming, it's not, it's, th there's reasons for it. So how simple are some of these fixes? Like how is, is it rocket science going in there and fixing some of the stuff? No, it's not rocket science. Um, it's not simple, but it's not rocket science. It's, it's in the middle. Um, what's, what's the term for not simple, but not rocket science? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Middle. It's a middle, yeah. middle, uh, tough. So yeah, man, you're dealing with a lot of emotions, first of all. And, you know, you have to convince – the hardest part is trying to convince you, the people in the studio and the mm. community that you're going to be better than how it's been for two years, three years, one year, right? This club's been sitting there. You go into a gym, it sucks. You go into the gym again, it still sucks. You see a sign out front that says new ownership, you're probably going to think it sucks, so it's going to be hard to get back in there. That's the, that's the give and take I was telling you about with purchasing already open ones and doing your own. Mm-hmm. I mean, you get in at a better deal, you buy it cheaper than it would be to build it. But then the risk is you don't know, you don't really know why it's underperforming. You think you know why, but you really don't know why. What's the, from your experience, like how, how often are you right with why you think it's underperforming? I mean, or what's the surprise yeah, that you've seen? No, it, it changes. Like you look at the location and you're like, oh, this is easy. No problem. And then you go there and you're like, oh, I could see why they had some issues and it cost you more money. You know, if you don't, if you're, what does they say? If you're dumb, you got to be tough or rich. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, um, are you looking at any other, other brands that to do the same thing with, or like is a hundred uh, cycle bars <laughs> going to keep you busy for a while? Um, I'm looking at the other exponential. We'll probably stay under the exponential portfolio. Um, but I'm looking at some of the other brands as well. Yeah. And I mean, a hundred studios is going to take us what seven years, probably if we really get cooking. Um, so eight years. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of other the exponential brands that I'm sure will be going secondhand market. Yeah. And, and that's typical in franchising. I mean, we see it with Club Pilates, which has, you know, been a fantastic brand overall, but still there's comes a point when franchisees aren't going to can, continue to expand and open up locations. So opportunities come up. And that's what a lot of people don't realize when they first start buying franchises is just the opportunity 
when a brand reaches a certain age or a certain amount of franchises open, franchisees are ready to get out for a lot of different reasons. It's not always what, you know, we would initially think. So there's just tons yeah. of opportunity. I think that's the point of this is, you know, there is so much opportunity. Even if you, if a brand is, is like underperforming in ways, there is usually opportunity there if you know what to look for. So any, like any, as you look back and how you got started in franchising, like even you had to start over today, like how would you, how would you do it today? What would you do differently today than you did when you first started? Uh, I'd probably raise a bunch more money than I needed and then go bigger, faster than I did now. I'm, I think the same thing when we were building out the salons in Orange County and like the biggest mistake we made was not, buying more we were just coming out of the the big recession mm. and real estate deals were just awesome but we didn't know it at the time you know we we mm -hmm. were like fighting and we were getting high ti dollars and tenant improvement dollars where the landlord gives you money back to build and we were getting like lots of money for that and we were turning down deals because we're like no they're they're only giving us 40 dollars a square foot and we want 50 dollars a square foot oh no way and, and then, you know, three years later, we're getting like $10 a square foot and paying a <laughs> lot more in rent. We're like, oh my gosh. So that was a big mistake that we made. And I look back and a lot of my brands is that's the thing that I would have done differently is I would have grown faster. Um, and would you have started out right away with, with two or three, or would you, do you think it's smart just to go and get the first one open, learn, and then do rapid expansion after you open up one? Yeah, I would definitely want to have experience before I went and did eight. I mean, I would have been ludicrous if I just went in there. They wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have sold them to me anyway because um, they kind of bet those people out. But our, there's probably nobody that crazy. I mean, people think I'm nuts already. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would definitely get experience with one or two and know what you're doing, right? I got lucky because the Club Pilates, they, they run all their systems pretty, as you know, pretty simultaneously. It's just different mm -hmm. products. Um, so I, I, I was just in the right spot at the right time, man. And now it's like, I feel like it's the gold rush and. But you took advantage of it. Like how many people wouldn't have done that? And I was just did a, a post on that the other day. Like you know, I was in the right place at the right time randomly, but you know, there's something in, I don't know if it's my mindset, my heart, just the way I saw things, but I, I saw opportunity and I, and I just went for it. Is that kind of just in your personality yeah. as well? Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. I mean. People are like, man, you got one, man, you got two, man, you got three. And I'm like, and then the co corporate call me, be like, you want three more in the next three months? I was like, I'll take them. <laughs> and then I started finally, like some of my, my team members were like, hey man, let's just, let's just get these rolling on. I'm like, let's just go, let's go for it. So I've always been like that, man. We were buying fourplexes in Vegas in the hood. People thought we were stupid and they were going to, it was going to keep going down. We're like, let's buy. Is it, so, the hood, yeah. is it still in the hood? Yeah, it's better. It's actually got gentrified. I mean, we sold them, but um, we have, that's how we stepped up and bought our hundred units, but it's getting better. So and stepping up, I mean, that's a good thing too. Cause I mean, I've, um, you know, that's how I've stepped up as I've, I've started, I've bought and I've sold and real estate, you know, I did flips when I was in my twenties and, and that's how I got money to be able to buy franchise. I did multiple flips. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and if I was, if I uh, was always buying to keep whatever it was, I would have not have been able to um, accelerate as fast as I have in what I own today. So similar philosophy that you have in terms of- That's funny, man. Yeah. Me and my brother were doing flips to start all this and we'd get, I'd give him 30 grand and give me back 60. I was like, that was cool. And then, um, and then he was the one that actually got me in the fourplexes and then we started flipping up, flipping up, you know, selling two fourplexes to get a 30 plex rehabbing it the whole time I was rehabbing that and then I'd go open a studio and then I'd go rehab another building and then go open another studio let that go and then when that made money then this go I've been just doing that the whole seven years six years let's finish on one topic and I think it's something that both you and I um, um, have experience with and that is being around really smart people you know like I want to be around people that are smarter and better than me so I can learn from them and I also want to bring other people up to where I am as well. And it sounds like you have the same philosophy and you know, what I'm getting at is, you know, part of the Facebook group and then even the event that you're having and you had like, give me some, um, some insight into your mind around that and like learning, like the, how do you learn? How do you level up? Yeah. So 
uh, learning, I mean, my whole thing is helping people, right? Like you start to wonder when you make more money and you start, all you want to do is make money when you don't have it. And then when you start making money, you're like, okay, now I got to do something. And then you start, you start to realize why all these people are giving back. So mm -hmm. I did that and I started to have all these people ask me questions about what I do. So I'm like, I'm going to start a group and show everybody my life and have them show theirs to each other. And then six months later, we're at 1.6 thousand people. Um, and they're all like telling me I'm changing your life. You're changing my life. I don't even click like on your videos, but I freaking love it. I'm so motivated now. <laughs> so it's been awesome, man. And then the other question you asked me so was like with the, with the mastermind group. Or, mastermind, or yeah. yeah. Okay. So then we started a mastermind cause we're like, you know what masterminds are missing is they're missing an adventure and to be able to have fun with people, right? They're all so corporate. You go there and you sit there and you do this, that, and the other, and you sit in a conference room and you go to dinner, right? And you go party or whatever. So we're like, let's go have people like do adventures, like something that they'll never do in their whole life and push them to the edge. And then on top of that, have buddies that you have for life. So we started a mastermind and we started in places all over the world. And so uh, on our second one, it was really great. The first one, um, we just took them out on the beach, right? These people had never done yoga or they'd never done workouts or, you know, we took them bungee jumping. Um, they freaked them out. So, I mean, stuff like that. And then we, Took them the really nice experience they'd never be able to do. We rented a $30 million yacht for the day and we all hung out on that. And then, you know, you have masterminding sessions and you're learning and the, the relationship you have with these people is so great when you're hanging out with them and doing fun stuff with them and just letting your, nobody even had a collared shirt on the whole time. And um, when you're starting to be able to communicate with these people, we had one guy that had 5,000 apartments there and one guy that owned a huge property management company the guy that 5,000 apartments flew out there in the next week and sat down on a whiteboard and went over his whole business with them to help him restructure. And so, I mean, stuff like that, you don't get anywhere, man. No, it's just you don't. insane. And, and like what you just said about adventure and doing stuff, like not just having a dinner or being in a, in a conference room. Um, I was in a, a meeting like that in, in uh, park city and I spent, you know, three days skiing. I got to know more people nice. skiing than, than anything else. And, and I absolutely loved it. And so I 100% agree. So like, what, what's kind of the, the thing in Aruba? Like, what's the, what are some of the, the adventures that you're going to be doing there? Or is it all top secret? No, it's all top yep. secret. That's the whole thing, man. I've always loved secrets as a kid and I never really got too many of them. And so now my whole thing is we're going to tell you where to go. We're going to tell you what to bring. We're going to tell you how long we're going to be there. And we got the whole, we got the rest. We got, it's going to be sweet, man. Well, it's perfect. You're on the franchise it, podcast. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any advice that you would give to anybody out there that whether it's an owner, why don't we start two, two things and then, and then we're going to wrap up. So what advice would you give to an owner that is currently like their head's just not in the game and, and, you know, either they've got to get their head in the game and and get that thing turned around or they gotta they've got to sell it to somebody like you like what advice would you give that person that's just in any franchise in general any franchise, right any franchise yeah um you know marketing don't treat marketing as an expense man i mean you cannot you cannot spend enough on marketing and if that's the one thing which a lot of people cut out first absolutely go put money and start calling the other franchisees that are successful and mimic their marketing moves that's another thing too. Reach out to the franchisees that are mm -hmm. successful. That's why you have a friend. That's why you're in a franchise. You have other people that are doing the same thing you are. That's the simplest thing to do. And I see so many people just not do that. I mean, I've been on airplanes just to go spend a day with a top performing franchisee and going in with the mindset of like, what are they doing that I'm not doing versus going in and being like, oh, I'm doing everything that they're doing. If you do that and you go into the right mindset, and again, you build relationships and friendships at, out of that and yeah. invaluable. So what so advice awesome. would you give for somebody that is thinking like, shoot, I, I like this turnaround thing. I, I wanna do something like that in my franchise that I'm involved with because I know some people are struggling and I could go buy them out. Like what advice would you give that franchisee and, in their franchise system? Um, I would give yourself another six months of income, working capital on top of what you think it's going to take. That would be the, my main thing. We ran into that. We're like, oh yeah, we're going to jump in and turn this thing around the first couple. And it doesn't happen like that. No. And then it's if you can't do it. Slow process. Yep. And then if you can't do it, if you do it, then great. But if you can't do it, then 
it's so easy. I mean, I, even I struggle with if things aren't going to budget to start pulling back on the things that I know that I shouldn't mm -hmm. pull back on. And even though I know I shouldn't do that, I still think about it. I don't do it, but I think about it. Do you ever, do you feel the same way sometimes? Yes, like, man. I was funny when we were talking about marketing earlier, when you walk into a studio, I was like, you know, I've been a victim of it myself. I've seen myself being like, let's just cut the Facebook from 1500 to 750 for a couple of months, you know? And then you're like, no, 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 that's the wrong move. <laughs> I've been there, man. I've been there. Or, Hey, let's fire that person. Cause, uh, you know, let's, let's cut the staff. I mean, I've been there, man. I understand it, but yeah, knowing that's that. not the right. No, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, it's knowing that that's not the right thing in your head. That's the key, right? Then you know, okay, you can turn back around, but you don't know that's not the right thing. First thing you're going to think, cut, cut, cut. Yep. Yep. Oh, it's so true. Such great advice. Hey man, thanks for coming on and um, just giving some value to everybody. And the turnaround is something that, you know, I'm probably going to be getting into. And uh, so you'll be getting some phone calls from me. Maybe I'll be in Aruba and, um, and, yes, and you some should. secrets exposed there. It sounds like a blast. So will you come on again at some point? Yeah, man. hundred percent. I'd love to come on and just share my status. I can't wait, man. I'm excited. I get up every morning and I'm like, God, why is he here yet? Why is my hundred not here yet? <laughs> It's just fun, man, because it's something that nobody thinks, I don't know, I feel like it's something that nobody thinks is even fathomable, so I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do oh. multifamily and apartment or franchises, so <laughs> it's great, it. man. They can join in my uh, Facebook group. Um, do you want me Let's to tell them? I, I set up a, web, a website to get there. It's uh, 10x.kevineasterly.com, and it will go cool. directly there. Awesome. 10x.kevineasterly. Dot com. Dot com. And then um, we'll put that in the show notes as well. Okay. I'll be in there, I'll be active in there. And there's a lot of, it's a very active, fun Facebook group. A lot of them are boring and um, not this one. <laughs> yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. We do a, a lot of work. We do a lot of lives in there. Facebook lives. People are meeting people all over the country and doing business with them in there and learning a ton. And it's free. You don't have to worry about it. We're not selling anything. We're just having a good time. That's what we're well, doing it for. I love it. I'll put those in the show notes and um, we'll uh, get some of these listeners on it.